Achtung, Achtung. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray and James Holland. Who have we got today? This is this is uh, excellent stuff, this. Quite pleased yeah. about this. Special guest, special guest, very, very important guest. Yeah. Um, friend of the show, friend of the independent company, uh, a man who is, I think it's fair to say, completely obsessed with the 52nd Lowland Division. Well, I like to think we've radicalised him. I think... <laughs> <laughs> Feels like you have. Do you think? Do you think before before we came along, he was he was a normal person just enjoying life. Yeah, yeah. It was. <laughs> and then suddenly it all went. Pear-shaped. I think we are a prime example of internet radicalization, where he's he's basically we're, he's been listening to our stuff too much, and he's radicalized <laughs> he himself. Him. <laughs> you don't know how true that is. <laughs> so, anyway, welcome, Andy Aitchison. It's lovely to have you on the show. Yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah, lovely. I think I might have invited myself though, so I don't. I don't know why. Well, <laughs> you know, I don't quite know how. I you know, don't, yeah. that's not. Yeah. There's no no point in getting hung up on the um, wiser wherefores. Um, one question I've got though, just before we get, get uh, into this, is yeah. why are we only doing acting acting these days? We've been through them all, done all the languages, and also Tony <laughs> used to write the introductions and he's given up because there's, there's no point. <laughs> he's gone to Qatar. Yeah, it's gone to Qatar. Exactly. What are Qataris is? No, it would just be Arabic, <laughs> wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly. Anyway, friend of the, I think definitely friend of the show, Andy Aitchison, who in in turn radicalised me to a sense. So that the the you know it's been a mutual a mutual process, hasn't it? Yeah, the quid pro quo. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you what. Something very exciting turned up the other day. Oh, Hold yeah. on, let me just show you. First edition. Oh, there you go. First oh, edition. Nice. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to put up with rubbish. Cheap paperbacks that, that self splits. destruct. Yeah. 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 Th- there is an issue. Not that I know a lot about it, but there's an issue with the first edition in that some of them are missing a chapter in it. So you might have to check. Oh. So the, there's a chapter on the, the Castile. Yeah. Uh, that's missing in some of them. Wow. So I've I've had to buy a new copy. Which, which chapter is it out. that's missing? Uh, let me just have a little look on my one. I have it to hand, of course. Of course he does. It's halted in the Broder Bosch. So it's page 160. It's page one's, yeah, have you got it? That's the one. Why would I know that? Yeah, uh, well, oh, there you go. Well, yeah. Phew. That's all I can say. That's actually the question. Um, uh, I know how I got into this book. Y- you got me into it, um, Andy. But how how did you end up so interested in uh, this book and in Peter White? What's the story? I came in for the the Saving Private Ryan route. I'd kind of I'd read Spike Diaries yeah. when I was a kid, and I was fascinated by them. Um. But then I watched Saving Private Ryan and it was, I mean, I know people have got opinions on that, that the, the film nowadays, yeah. but at the time, I don't think people remember just what an impact that yeah, had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so through that, I got into Stephen Ambrose. And again, people have got opinions about him, but I have a huge soft spot for Ambrose. Yeah, I think all. The stuff he did in interviewing the veterans. Yeah, but also he's, he's the daddy got... of that. I mean, he was the first person oh, yeah. to take these little episodes and, and, and you know, no one before had the idea of following an yeah. individual company yeah 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 and, and and he just and he just kind of he opened up i hadn't really realized there was those kind of books available and they're very easy to read and you know i got into band of brothers and i read uh parachute infantry by david kenny webster which is another fabulous Brilliant book we'll have to put on yeah. to, to, to audio book al okay um so i was just about to go to northern ireland it was two it was actually 21 years ago this month and of course this is before the days of smartphones all the rest of it so you used to buy as many books as you can and take them over when you went on tour, operational tour. And I went into Borders Bookshop in Cambridge. It's uh, RIP. It was a fantastic bookshop. And there was this book there with the jocks, and it was advertised as Britain's answer to Band of Brothers. <laughs> I distinctly remember it being advertised as that. And I thought, well, I like Band of Brothers. So I picked it up, and of course, you open it, and you think, oh, this is nothing like Band of Brothers whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, and that was it, really. And I took it to Northern Ireland. I read it in a couple of days, so that, that didn't really help me for the, for the, the hours of boredom that, that ensued. But it, it was really obvious very early on, this is not a normal book. I'd read Lion Rampant by Robert Willicombe. I'd read Brave and Bobby, and they're all fantastic books. But with the jocks, and I mentioned this on my talk, which we did in, in the festival yeah. earlier this year, it's the level of detail. Yeah, and straight away there's a, a there's a level of detail which you just don't get into any other books. Yes, yeah. yeah, and that was it. I was hooked, and actually it stayed at that for years. And you just mentioned about radicalizing. Um, <laughs> the truth is, you were you did radicalize me because going into the lockdown, I, I was kind of listening to the podcast. I was involved, and of course, I think we all went a little bit crazy yep. uh, in the lockdown, and I just went with it. And and we'll probably go into talking about the the, the, the stuff in the book. Uh, itself, but there's a strata. There's just different stratas of detail in the book that you can just go back to, and, he, and and white leaves a trail of crumbs 
for all these stories, all these people, all the things he's seen. And if you follow those crumbs, you can actually just find out so much more. So it's it's one of those books, it, 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 the more you read it, the more it expands and the more you can use it as a sort of vehicle for researching. But also, I think I, I think going on a on a personal journey of discovery with stories from the war is incredibly exciting. Uh, you, yeah, you, you know, as soon as you individualize it, so you have a favorite squadron or a favorite destroyer or a favorite company or battalion, then suddenly they become yours, and you yeah. kind of, in a sort of weird way, you sort of feel a part of it. And, and so you then yeah. want to go where they've been. You want to stand where they've stood. And it's just, it's it's about making connections, isn't it? And it's about finding stuff out for yourself and learning things that you didn't know. And, and so yeah. following in, the, I completely understand why you would want to follow in the footsteps of the 52nd and go in Lowland Division and, and, and go and see where they were and, and find out more. I, I totally, totally get that. And I think that kind of detective work as well is part of the attraction of, of, of researching the war. It's kind of delving yeah. deeper into something. And I think blokes generally, they like having hobbies and they like having little obsessions. It's kind of part of part of the, the DNA, isn't it? And, and, and this just feeds into that. For those who don't know about you, you're a sapper, right? Well, I was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to varying degrees of success. Well, well yeah, but, sapper, but yeah. Do, you think, do you think having, do you think your having been a soldier has some bearing on your relationship with this book? Or it, because there are the rhythms of soldiering and the aspects of it are eternal and yeah. British army aspects that are eternal. Who knows, who knows whether it's any army other than the British army. Is, is that something that, that you found in the book? Definitely. I mean, there's, there's bits of it which I will never, ever really, truly understand because I was a sapper. Yeah. I didn't go to Afghanistan. You know, uh, there are some members of the independent company that did, and they have a much better idea of that element to it. But there are some universals about the army and the experience in the army, which absolutely ring true. And, you know, on operational tour, you're reading the book and you're thinking, well, this is, you know, when you're you're hungry, you're wet, you're cold, somebody's telling you what to do. You know, it, all that stuff really rings true and it does resonate more. And it resonates for everybody who reads it, but definitely if you've been in the army. And it's very well regarded in the army as well. Certainly when I was in, a lot of people had read it at the time. And I know a lot of officers certainly had read it. It's it's part of I think it definitely used to be part of their their literature review that they would have to do, and I actually know there's a copy an original copy down at Shrivenham as well. So, it's it's relatively well known in the army among certain circles, and I think it I think a lot of it is because it rings true. And as a young platoon commander, and I was a sapper, I was right at the bottom of the pile. But I think as a as a young platoon commander, certainly you would get a lot from it, because the internal monologue is so strong in it. And it's not just the internal monologue that you would want people to hear. It's actually him talking about how he feels at, at, at quite a deep level. I mean, about how scared he is, about how worried he is about letting people down and things like that. So actually, linking to what you said, you know, you used it in your book, Commandel. I think as a command manual, it's like, it's up there with Slim's Defeat into Victory in terms of you get the, 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 the idea of what it's like to command and how you can command. I mean, you know, the, the thing that he's always thinking about is how to remain emotionally continent. That's the sort of the, the thing he's working on throughout in the book. You know, I, I mean, I almost feel if you were someone wondering about how how your emotions work and how you can work on your emotions, this is this is a brilliant book. You know, because yeah. that's what he spends an enormous amount of time doing, and how he bear, how how that. Op bears on his responsibilities and his relationships with the people he has responsibilities to, which is the essence of the job, you know, um, yeah. that he's doing, isn't it? It's this constant sort of conflict between the, the sense of duty, which he has, and, and this is one of his key things, the sense of duty which actually overpowers some of his more base human emotions and, and his religious uh, ideas as well. It's a really good example where the duty comes first, and the welfare of his men and the welfare of his of, of his comrades it, it overrides everything else. And he's always thinking about what the right thing to do at the time is, even if he's tired and he's hungry and he's actually scared. I mean, Klosterhoff is the classic example where he's got to make, and I think you you highlighted it um, uh, in the book as well, where he's got to make that run of about 70 metres and he knows he's going to be killed. But him and his sergeant look at each other, they make eye contact. The sergeant actually is a D-Day veteran. He's in the, the Green Howards. He knows that White's dead. 
and he still does it because it's the right thing to do. His duty says he's got to get to the company HQ and he's got to take control and lead. And, and that's the thing. It's But he doesn't get killed, obviously. He doesn't. And that's it. I mean, he's absolutely convinced this is it. I mean, this is, he's, he's going to get killed. But of course, that's the luck. And you know from, from the Sherwood Rangers that the, the difference between living and, and dying is... It's a hair's breadth. It's it's nothing. It's it's a whim. Yeah. It's a it's a turn of a head. It's a second. It's a, a whatever. And he's and he's able to write this book by drawing on. I mean, what does what did he do to get this book together? Because you know, it wasn't published that long ago, was it? In the big scheme of things. Yeah, it's it's quite a long story. So in diaries the... and and, yeah. and letters. So I think I think to answer that, you have to sort of understand his approach to kind of the world around him. So from a very, very early age, I've managed to, to have access to a lot of his original diaries and, and a lot of his original artwork. Where, so just very quickly, Andy, where, where are they? So they're located in Scotland. I mean, some of the other private collections as well, but they're located in Scotland. We, we, there's an archive there which I've been in contact with, and they're, uh, they've been really helpful in terms of letting me have access to it. So I travelled up in May uh, this year to have a look because I knew I was going to be doing the talk. I mean, I, I, as a little diversion, it's one of those things, you know, when you go into the archives and you might have one or two bits you have a look at in the in the whole day that are actually gold and they really you know yep. are, are are interesting i turned up there and i just wasn't prepared for 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 what it was there was five or six big boxes full of his diaries and and linking to what we're saying about how he wrote it so what he does is he he's training to be an artist from any age his mother was actually an artist she was a very very highly skilled portrait artist from south africa so it's kind of in his dna or in his family from a very early age, he decides he wants to become an artist. So as part of that discipline, he trains himself. And again, it's a sense of duty. It's a sense of responsibility. He trains himself. So when he goes around during his day, he sees things and he observes things. And then before he writes anything down, he draws a couple of sketches from that day. And he pretty much does that every day for about six years leading up to this, leading up to him going to Northwest Europe. So... And, and it could be anywhere. It could be he saw something in the street. It could be something he was given a lecture on, or it could be something he saw on a newsreel. So on, on some of the diaries, you actually see what he's seen on the newsreel that, that day. And so he observes everything. And I think what happens is when he gets to Northwest Europe, there's a kind of muscle memory there. So when he's in Trips Hath Woods, for example, and he's dug in, he can't help but observe in that artist way. And that allows him then to, to sear it onto his brain. So later up, what he does when he's at the front is he writes up his notes on his army notepad and he sends it off to his father. He also draws a, a quick sketch if he's got time. The sketches um, are just absolutely stunning. And, I, and one of the things that I've noticed with mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of people who, who are, are, are very competent artists yeah. is, and, and we made this point out, didn't we, when we were looking at Dennis Barnum, a lot of the time the, the – the sketches are far more evocative of of a of a mood and, and a kind of an atmosphere than a photograph. There's lots going on. They, they they feel really alive, don't they? Sometimes, and and these are just absolutely stunning, aren't they? And, and also, like, the, 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 there's an accuracy to them. Some of them are. I mean, in the, in the actual in the original diaries, when he's a kid, some of them are just fanciful pictures. But when he's at the front, there's an accuracy to them. And I, and there's actually a, a, one of the pictures is the southern gate of. Waldfeucht, which is the the small German town where he takes on the tiger tank with a pit, and there's a there's a, a an IWM newsreel and photograph of the gate, and it is exactly the same. Now he's never seen that photograph because it was just filed away. This is evidence of the sort of level of skill and detail and and the accuracy of these drawings as well. So when you see the other drawings within the collection, you think, well, they must be as accurate, as equally accurate. So it's it's astonishing. And, and, and the sketches are up there as well, are they? Yeah, they are. Yeah, so 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 where the way his diary is laid out, when he's got it, it's kind of equivalent of A four. It wasn't called A four then. Basically, what he does is he he draws a couple of sketches within the, the the page, and then he writes around it. So the sketch comes first, and then the words, um, and that starts to ease off a little bit once he's actually into the army, because of course he's got less time and and security reasons. Sometimes he can't. But when he's at the front, he just he'll draw on anything, and what he would do is he'd post that back to his father. And his father would file it away. I mean, God, to think, I hate to think what his father thought of when he received these these pictures and these notes. And, and he carried that on right the way through the rest of his life. Uh, and so the, the diaries are very voluminous, are they? Oh, uh, huge. I mean, so every year would be a, a maybe, I think, a, maybe 100-odd pages per year and, and about 50-50 between words and pictures. 
and they're, I mean they're amazing to see and it's just it was just it, it gives you such a, a an idea of what he was seeing and how he was seeing things you know when he was in the in the home guard when he was in the anti-aircraft battery before he eventually transferred into the KOSB one thing do, do his paintings ever come up for sale very, very occasionally. And when they do, I can't afford them. <laughs> they, they do. I've actually seen a couple of these paintings. I visited a family member earlier this year and they've actually got a couple. His main thing, he was mainly into commercial art to, uh, after the war. So a lot of adverts, a lot of uh, illustrations for books, but he did do portraiture as well. And I've, I've seen a portrait he did and it was it, very much of its, t- of its age, but it's exceptional quality. And I've also got one of his geography books. So after the war, he, 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 he illustrated and wrote a geography book um for schools and and it's just and it's just wonderful uh, really really descriptive writing and really descriptive uh for pictures and it was it was aimed at school kids to give them an idea of what the united kingdom was like well I, i've just been looking at edward r Dizoni's some um, uh war diaries which are just incredible yeah uh, and he was uh he was not as an incredibly famous book illustrator i think mm. stick of the dump that was him i think um, and he did all those sort of Ginger and Tim go to sea and all that kind of stuff that came out in the kind of 1950s yeah. and stuff. Uh, and, yeah. you know, if you saw one of his sketches, you'd, you'd absolutely be familiar with it. But anyway, he was he became a, an official war artist, and he was out in Italy, and, and he became really tight with, with Alex, who was also a, a dab hand at painting along with everything else he touched. Um, and, yeah. uh, and again, it's, it's, it's that kind of evocation. It's that sort of of a time and a place and a moment that just really comes alive in a way that it doesn't in a photograph. It's incredible, really. Yeah, yeah it's, there's a real connection to what you're seeing uh, and and a real connection to the people because, of course, he does quite a few, you, you'll notice in the book, he does quite a few pictures of his actual jocks yeah. and the yeah. men. And, and all they all seem to die. Got... I mean, yeah. you know, 10 yeah. days later. <laughs> it's like, whatever you do, yeah. don't sit for Peter White. Yeah, that's is very true. Yeah, so 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 we see Jones actually. Jones is of course one of the standout characters, the paratrooper. And what I hadn't realised when I first looked at the picture, one of his eyes looks a little bit funny. And since doing the research, we managed to track down a little bit of information about Jones. And actually, we don't know which parachute division he was in, but he, he, they mentioned France, so he's probably six airborne, and he and he is medivac with uh, with an eye injury. So there's little details that you that, that just span the kind of the, I don't know whether the ether or whatever as you think oh that's why his eye looks a little bit funny in that picture because White's captured that right. because when he was in Sixth Airborne he's injured his eye so there's there's these little these little sort of date stamps and and notes about the individual that you, that, that it's only when you start really picking at it you pick up in it and it adds to the, adds to the the story just um for those who haven't read the book and aren't familiar and maybe those who are so foolish as to not listen to the audio book. Just, just let's just talk about Private Jones because he is one well, of. Maybe the, we should actually just sorry. Maybe we should just say he, what what battalion we're talking well, about. Yes, here. let's yes let's start. <laughs> yeah, let's, of course, let's, yeah. yeah, let's uh, start at the very beginning. Um, the very very best place to start, um, as they sound the sound of music. So, um, so he's mother South African. He's uh, he he come. They come to Britain. He lives yeah. in Surrey. He um, yeah. joins the uh, joins up. And becomes an officer, then goes to Fifty Second Lowland Division. So, the, 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 yeah. So basically, yeah. So he, he well, he he starts off. He joins up, joins the Home yeah. Guard, like a lot of young men did. He then gets uh, put into a, a, a light anti aircraft regiment, yes. and he becomes a Beaufort's commander. He commands a Beaufort's gun in the north North Yorkshire somewhere. And then, of course, it's getting towards forty four, and they realise there's lots of very able young men standing around on a Beaufort's gun in Britain yeah. somewhere, which is obviously redundant more or less now yeah. and so they troll through them and, and really what, what what he's told is that he's going to be battle casualty replacements for for d-day yeah. so at the end of 43 he gets put on his platoon commander's battle course he goes to the isle of man to do that um it's an incredibly tough course and this is really harking back to monty's battle drill yeah. this course is absolutely built around that 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 foundation uh, and he does this course in fact what's interesting is a little bit of connection there is the the large the final exercise they do in the Isle of Man the, the battle course which which Peter absolutely loves is called Exercise Longstop, and the battle is based on a set piece battle that they had at Longstop. So you've got the Churchill tanks going up really? the hill, you've got the the battalions the, the the battalion shaking out into that open formation, and that is what they're training. So on they're rerunning to teach the they're guys. rerunning Longstop. Absolutely, I've got a picture of it as well, which I'll, I'll share, with, share with you guys. That is fascinating. I've been to Longstop. 
I would, that's on my list. That is one of my top, <laughs> top lists to visit. Very red soil. That's what I remember about it. It's incredibly red soil. And the, the hills, are, but you know, the valley is is really very, it's quite tight. You know, it's, it's uh, the Majorda Valley is, is quite, you can see why Longstop's such a dominating, dominating thing. Yeah, and the of course. The of high ground, in it, with... you know, overlooking any va- valley. <laughs> that's always a shocker. Mm, yeah. And there's a connection there, of course, with Spike, who's on yeah. Longstop, and, and Tony Goldsmith, and it's, you know, you start to sort of paint a picture. Um, so then then he does that, and that's when he gets the choice. You can go to any one of these battalions. His father, we think, might have been in the KOSB, but he certainly has a connection to the to the borders. So he decides to join the KOSB, and this is where, of course, he, he hears about the mountain division. And, of course, Peter's an outdoors person. He's incredibly physically fit. He loves outdoor stuff. And he thinks, well, I'll be able to do that. I can learn to ski. I can do all this stuff. And little does he realise he ends up joining the 52nd Lowland. And he does actually go up to the Cairngorms and he's there for a month or two before before they really just, the, the, the whole mountain stuff is pushed to one side. Um, and that's where he joins. So he joins 4th Battalion, the King's Own Scottish Borders, which is the East and Border Battalion. So the KOSB is split up into regions. The Sister Battalion, the 5th, is Galloway, the Fries and Galloway, uh, who's also in division. And they, they form 155 Brigade, which is part of 52nd. Yeah. I tell you what, we're going to take a very brief break and then we'll continue with Peter White's career as it careers towards action. We'll see you in a moment. Welcome back to We Have Ways to Make You Talk uh, with me, um, Al Murray and James Holland. And we're talking to Andy Aitchison about... Peter White with the jocks. For those who are members of our Patreon, you may have listened to the audio book that we've had up um, uh, for, for ages now because it's a, a, a mighty tome. So he goes to the King's Own Scots Borders and you're saying that, that they're slightly different, configured on different recruitment areas, aren't they, For um, within Scotland? Although one of the striking features in the book is, is that there, there are lots of Cockneys as well in the 52nd Lowland Division. He wow, says, it's 1944, isn't it, by the time they get over there? It leads to sort of, you know, lang- sort of descriptions from the time where he's saying the combination of the Cockney and a jock working together is really rather special. It's the sort of thing the pub landlord would say and, um, and that I'd get in trouble for <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> but you're still quite enjoying reading. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I've got details on all the all the fatal fatal guy, the guys that were yeah. killed in his platoon. And it's about 50-50. There's 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 about fifty percent jocks and fifty percent English. Yeah. He mentions one of the guys who's got an Irish lilt, but when, when I've checked back in his history, he's, he's he's not Irish. I think he's from, from Yorkshire somewhere, but well, quite what's going well, on. Well the thing is 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 after all this is pre television, so who's to know? Um, yeah. uh, and yeah. people aren't as familiar with um, each other's accents across the country as they might be. And there's that really famous story about Charlie Chaplin's called as a witness in a trial in the Lake District. I think before he goes to the US and no one can understand him, he's, you know, he's a Cockney. They think he's French. They don't know. They don't, <laughs> they don't know what accent. They don't That's know what brilliant. accent he's got at all. Well, and so I, I think I think we should take a moment to to appreciate your Scottish accent in the in the in the audio book, Al, because he's writing it in Border Scots as well. So it's not. It's not just generic Scottish. No. There's lots of border yeah. border accents in there. I, so I had well to done. Take the plunge on that. Decide I'm going to do it anyway, even if it's crap. You got to commit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's new turf for you, isn't it? You don't do you don't do accents. No, I don't do impressions. No, as everyone knows. Um, but but um, <laughs> but um, so so um, and then of course, what happens to um, Fifty uh, Second Lowlanders? They go into First Allied Airborne Army as reserve because they're because they're part yeah. of um, Fortitude Deception plan basically aren't they they're part of the muster yeah, for an invasion of a, a putative invasion of norway aren't they yeah and i i i suspect and i've got to i've got to do a little bit more digging i think the minute morgan puts pen to paper sort of 43 and he starts thinking about normandy yeah. and what becomes overlord and all the rest of it i think the whole any idea of norway is out the yeah i think it's I, the division itself what i suspect is the, the the certainly if the commanders in the division know about it they don't let on but I, the, the division itself is still training and, and, and you know taking it seriously. Yeah. They're trialing equipment. They're trialing things, but it's it's dead. It's done and dusted by by sort of mid late forty three. Yeah. And of course, in in July they do they go through combined operations training around about sort of late spring, early summer, yeah. and then in in July they get switched over to air transport division, and it's all Dakotas. But as as you as you mentioned in command. Uh, there's no Dakotas left, so they decide to put them into Wacos with a, with 12 hours notice. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, uh, yes, for, for Yes, yeah, so they spend so. <laughs> basically a day worrying about how to load a glider and then 
op yeah. cancelled. But they they are in that sort of peculiar position where they're they're strategic reserve. So at some point, yeah. as you know, anyone who knows how things are progressing that across that summer, they're going to get deployed um, because there's mm-hmm. they're the allies are running out of people it's as simple yeah. as that yeah i mean there's a there's a huge disappointment in the because they really think they've missed the boat especially with not so much arnhem but with up, up linen yeah. which is obviously a few weeks uh earlier and i i remember on the pod i forget his name but you had a guy talking about it up linen they really get excited because the great swan is on and as far as they know back in the uk the thing's over you know the germans are defeated and they're you know they're getting excited and when that's cancelled there's a real Notice will drop in morale, and it's noted in the fourth four KOSB's war history, not the war diary, the war history. They think, oh, this is it. We've missed the boat. We've been sat around for four years, and and we've got nothing to do. Five years. So yeah, yeah, they they, they get cancelled, and then almost immediately after Arnhem, they get switched over to to conventional infantry division, and then mid October they sail for for Northwest Europe. Yeah, I mean, I suppose uh, the the mountain training sort of has that thing of value in specialist training in making them cohesive, I guess. And that although it's a red herring in itself, it's not it, it's it's not necessarily a bad thing to have done. No. Well, and it builds into their esprit, doesn't it? So which is no a, a thing they you know, a thing they talk he talks about. And the uniforms yeah, are and all part actually, of that. And, and there and there are a couple of examples in the in the actual fighting and, and not just uh not just Peter, but also some of the other battalions where they decide to man pack equipment rather than wait for the vehicles. Yeah. Because it's part of their discipline. So on uh, Blackhawk, when they're fighting across the, the Saflin Beak and the armour, as, as, as James knows, the, 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 the armour bogs down, the, the battalions there, they just man-pack the mortars. There's, there's three battalions worth of mortars. It's all man-packed. They just put it on their back and they just carry it because it's part of their discipline. And the approach march to, to Heinsberg, that's a 12-mile approach march. And it's not a 12 miles and then stop. It's 12 mile approach, then straight onto the start line and straight into the battle. So there's a, there's a little bit of discipline there. But what's interesting, just calling back to when 52nd was first earmarked for mountain warfare, it's actually written in the terms of reference. First and foremost, they were a conventional infantry division. And there's a real sense that whoever's setting them up doesn't want another private army. They don't want another, you know, we're obviously talking about SS rogue heroes. What they don't want is another personal fiefdom. They are first and foremost conventional infantry that happen to be mountain yeah, trained. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I, although, I, yeah, I mean, that sort of blows both ways, though, doesn't it? Because because there, there is he does express pride in the fact he's wearing a different uniform to different people and and all that and all that sort of stuff. Oh yeah. So that, definitely. Oh, they're very proud of it, and they and they do like to, and the fact that they've got the windproof on, they like to. They like to say they're a bit different and a bit special. Yeah. It's a good yeah. look, uh, in my humble it's a, opinion. It's a strong it's look. Extremely strong look. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I've been flexing about getting a smock. I've been kind of just gearing up for it. Very hard to get an original. Very no, I wouldn't hard. get an original. I've sort of started giving up on originals because they just, you know, they're too old and they break. Yeah. Where you don't want to spill the soup on them or whatever. No, exactly. You know, but, but you the know, the, soup, there are yeah. there are manufacturers out there that do the the lowland smock. <laughs> Although famously, Jones, who we, we mentioned, yes. he famously still wears his his Paris. Yes, smock he's still in his in his Paris smock, isn't he? So so um uh, the, the the book opens. I mean, one of these things really that that um, White doesn't write about, but it's in the, in the introduction is that they don't think his fellow officers don't think he's cut out for it. They're a bit worried about him, aren't they? Yeah, and, and actually there's there's an unpublished chapter. So in the original book, there's an unpublished chapter where he actually explains what's going on. I think the, the thing about, and he says basically he doesn't fit the mould of a, of a conventional jock officer. And jock officers are seen as quite unique. Uh, what, they don't necessarily have to be Scottish, but they have to be able to deal with people from the east end of Glasgow or, you know, Kilmarnock or, or, or Leith. You have to be a certain type. You have to be outgoing. And I think it's a really good example where they completely misunderstand what it actually takes to be a commander in the field. Because, of course, none of these, I mean, one or two of them had been over on second BEF by this point, but not many. So they haven't really got a lot of battle experience themselves. And actually, they really misunderstand what it takes to be an officer in the front line in Northwest Europe. And actually, that comes out in the book because he's quiet. But that doesn't mean to say he's not strong willed. He's not he's not you know, dutiful, he's not, you know, bound by a code of sort of responsibility, if you like. So, yeah, I mean, and the CEO, the, the commanding officer at the time, it wasn't Chris Melville, it was the guy before that, Maxwell, he basically says, right, we're going to look to get you posted, the adjutant will do the paperwork. 
quite where they're going to put him, I, I don't know. And and very quickly after that, they change CEOs. And of course, by that point, they say, well, we haven't got time to do this, but we'll keep an eye on him. And they sort of push him sideways. They put him into the, because they're, they are transport, transportable role, uh, he's put in charge of the anti-aircraft section because, of course, because it's part of the Airborne Army, they have plus in 20 mil guns. And because he's done a little bit of that before, they put him in there. And I think they just try to see how he gets on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because when they land, he's not platoon commanding, isn't he? When he lands at Walker, and he's, uh, no. that's, not, that's not what he's doing. That's a thing that no. eventually comes to him. So, I mean, uh, mm-hmm. cause, because, I, I mean, this is, I think what's, what's really great and illustrative in the book is because it doesn't start at D-Day, your whole frame of reference for where you're coming at the thing has to be different. You know, you have to, yeah. you have to, there's a completely different start line, timeline to it in a way that, that yeah. makes you have to go, oh, right, you know, I mean, a great big set piece battle that he's part of that, I mean, I suppose at that point kind of shows allied muscle because, oh, yeah, all right, we'll do an amphibious landing. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, and we'll bash it together mm. dead quick and uh, we'll, we'll improvise and we'll use a mountain-trained division to land. I mean, partly because they've got the people, but it's because they know they could do it. And, and the opening yeah. of the book is very, very interesting because he has a cold opening to being in combat, doesn't he? He's... It, uh, they're in the landing craft yeah. and he goes. It's just, it's sort of yeah, that's as it. cold as that. <laughs> There's very very little build up, yeah. and we're into a battlefield that probably most people haven't heard yeah. of. I mean, different for the independent company and your listeners, yeah. obviously they have. But for your average your member of the public, what's what's the shell? What's the Volker? And they, they've never heard of it. And it's a huge operation, and it's hugely important. But yeah, I mean, he, he's straight into it. He's straight onto Uncle Beach. And and what's, what people don't realise, and a lot of people, when they read it, they don't realise he's not actually 10 platoon commander at that no. point. He is just, the, the for want of a better expression or one that we've used, he is the spare yeah, friend. Yeah, yeah. You know, he is just hanging around and he's he's doing the odd job. Um, but, of course, as the attrition starts to build, then then he has to go back into the, the, the platoons. But, I mean, even then, I mean, his, his, descrip- his descriptions of it all... Because in the interesting, in an interesting way, he's he's a little more detached at the start of the book, isn't he? Because he's yeah. because he's kind of spectating a little, and it's all happening to him for the first time. Yeah, it's really interesting. And what's fascinating is a lot of the patterns also forming that some of the Germans are a pushover, some of them very much aren't, um, and you just don't know who you're going to get in every encounter. Yeah. That's the sort of that's the sort of uh, tenor of it, isn't it? And and that's very much the way, isn't it? By that stage of the war. And 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 that ramps up the the longer you get, and the more into the forty five they get. That uncertainty at every single moment. It's kind of I was thinking about it, you know, in Normandy and and, and you know, fifty second don't have to suffer the the attrition of Normandy, and, and and you know that that's quite telling. In they're they're still operating after six months without really much of a break because they haven't had that that effect. But at, at Normandy, you know where you are. You know where you're going, you know where the Germans are, and you know pretty much what they're going to do because you're up against the SS, you're up against the, you know, the, the, the Panzer Lair. You know, they only have one mode. They, they're well, not- and also the Normandy battle, um, you know, is a, is a moment of decision for either side, isn't it? Whereas after Normandy, after Falaise, surely it's over. Just as you say, yeah. they, fear that they fear they're missing the boat. You know, they think they're going to miss yeah. out where Linnet's cancelled. And, and you're quite, I mean, this is, that's, a re, that's a really good point. As it gets later into the war, the more that carries on, of that you don't know what you're mm. going to get. Are they going to resist or are they going to surrender? It becomes f- so much. It's like, it's sort of, in a way, it's central to every encounter they have with the Germans. You know, uh, yeah. uh, uh, wherever it is, if, if they're resisting, it's like worse. Uh, and then, and then you, turn, you turn the corner and they don't resist. Yeah. And that's psychologically the impact of that is almost as bad as when they do resist. Yeah. Because, of course, when they do resist, you switch into battle drill, muscle memory. You start to do what you do automatically. But when you turn the corner and nothing happens, it, it's almost, I mean, I th- again, the Sherwood Rangers experience this. I mean, just to put this into context, the 40% of the book is April. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you read with the jocks, yeah. so you rush through the first couple of months and, that, and, and really... From about from the time they cross the Rhine, which is obviously after the main the main battle for the, yeah, for the Rhine crossing, March, isn't it? yeah, it's April for up until really the last last couple of pages. God, that's a good point, and, and that just gives you an an idea of just how intense that month was in terms of the psychological trauma of 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 one minute you're just sitting down and he's even mentioned the guy's sunbathing, you know, just taken in the sun. And then you've got the likes of Jones again. We go back to him. He turns a corner in the, in the vehicle and he's killed. 
And it's as simple as that. Uh, a couple of 88 rounds uh, and, and all of a sudden two guys are killed, three guys are wounded, and then they move on to the next road junction, the next corner. I, well, we were talking about this the other day and, and I was talking about it with Henry Sledge at the weekend about his father, Eugene. You know, it says, how do you come back and do normal yeah. after that? I just I just don't know yeah. how they did it. I, I just don't know how they did it. I really don't. And and certainly for White, uh, he didn't really come back and do normal and, and, and struggled for the rest of his life with it. I think, like all of the guys, and they all deal with it in their own way, but, I mean, White White was, was plagued by nightmares for the rest of his life. Was he? One story, when I was chatting to chatting to a family member, uh, when he got when he left left the army uh, and then in, into the forties, he lived in a big house with his mum and his brother in Wimbledon, and they used to rent out rooms. And one guy they rent a room out to would come in from work and he'd drop his boots on the floor and he was upstairs. And no matter what happened, what White was doing, when he heard the thud, he would stop and he would jump and he would sort of shock himself because this thud all of a sudden would make him sort of go back to the go back to what he had experienced. And actually, one night, Peter had gone to sleep and this man had come back into the into the house, dropped his boots on the thing, and it gave White such a fright. It woke him up with such a, 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 a sort of appalling shock that they had to ask, ask the guy to leave. So, so White, right the way through his life, really struggled to sleep. Any loud noises would just trigger it. And in fact, um, he would... Very similar to what Christopherson would do. You know, you mentioned that Christopherson would just every so often lock himself away for a few days and just deal with, with what was going on. White would quite often go off walking or he had a motorbike and he'd go off on his bike. And one time, not long after he was married, he was married quite late in the 60s, he, he decided he just had to go to Dartmoor and walk across the moors until he got out of his system. And I, I didn't really get the full details, but apparently he didn't really get it out of his system and it actually made him quite worse. So he lived a, a very successful life after the war in terms of art, his artwork, but just it just never leaves you. And 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 for White, it was it was sleep. But, but he got married. He had children, did he? Got a family? No, he well, he he got married, but he didn't have any of his own children. So he got married in in the late sixties, and he met his wife through the Christian Science Movement, which is key to to understanding sort of White and his personality. Um, he got married in I think about nineteen sixty seven, and um, his. Um, his new wife had two sons who were already late teens, early twenties, but um, uh, but uh, he he kind of took them on and and was um, was a father figure to, certainly to the younger the younger child, uh, and and was very very friendly and 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 nice. Did he travel? He he travelled a lot, didn't he? he made, you know, yeah. like sort of he had a kind of restlessness, didn't he? He 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 was he was kind of like that before the war as well. So he would he would. Often go out on his on his because of course he wasn't driving then. He would go out on his bike before the war and he'd cycle for, for for hours and hours and miles and miles. But after the war, he picked up a motorbike which he called um, called Ferdinand the Bull. So little Ferdinand, he'd have a sidecar and he would literally just get off and travel anywhere. He travelled around certainly southern Europe, all around Spain, Portugal, France, into Italy. We know he definitely went to to Walcheren because it's there's a photo in with the jocks. But I do often wonder. I wonder if he ever ventured further into Holland and Germany. Uh, there's no evidence yeah. of it, but I'd, I'd love so to find out. he didn't keep diaries after the war, what was it? He did, yeah. Yeah, not as much. He, he de- certainly kept diaries in, in the 40s and into the 50s. In the collection, there's only one one diary from 1952. Um, but but I suspect he probably had more. And, and what's happened to them, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. yeah. And th- th- this thing of, I mean, he, he writes about the war, about the war coming to a stop. It's an incredibly moving scene. The, the moment with the family, with the picture of someone in Luftwaffe yeah. uniform and uh, a son in Luftwaffe uniform, and them all crying, and and he, you know, and he says, you know, nothing could have so eloquently summed up the upper, utter waste and stupidity of the war, and the future, tr- futile tragedy it brought to so many homes right around the world than this family at that moment. And I think that, that's a mark of his empathy, isn't it? Because he's saying that about a German family. He's not saying yeah. he's thinking about the friends he's lost or the people yeah. in his family who might have been killed or the people he knows. He's, he's, he's saying it's happened to them too, which I think is, I mean, the, the book is a, the book is remarkable for his empathy because there are plenty of moments where, where I, you know, you stop and you think, well, I don't know. I don't know that I'd have been quite so, uh, quite so, yeah. um, so nice about that situation because he, because he doesn't like dishing out bollockings and, you know, um, no. and regrets them when he does because circumstances 
operate at such a sort of pitch mm. that the people he does bollock, he, you know, end up being killed. And then that's the last proper encounter you had with somebody, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Well, well, I mean, that's that's his, that's the thing that keeps him awake at yeah. night, the fact that he put Parry on a charge before he was killed in the ambush. Yeah. He just felt awful about it, and, and he just... I, he, I suspect that's one of the things that kept him awake. I, I, but, but, but the interesting thing about the last chapter, and the, that's kind of the only time he ever does get angry. The anger at the war and the people that started the war and what it's done to people is the only time he really expresses his anger in any kind of sort of measurable sense. Uh, and and actually, it's funny that I mean the jocks really do push him to the point of <laughs> to, to the point of anger. And it's like a really another great example of command, you know, dealing with people that you you have to look after, but also are absolutely exasperating. Yeah. And I know that from my time in the army, I, I I think I exasperated a few officers just 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 for incompetence and and laziness. But um, <laughs> yeah. And what's yeah. and and Andy? Do you have a sort of an end goal with this? Are you, are you going to write your own book? What are you, what are you, what are your plans of all this amazing information and research you've been yeah. doing? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a couple of things. I mean, I mean, it's, 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 it's early days. One thing I'm doing is focusing in the sort of before the actual war side of things. So there's that. I can't really say too much about that in a minute. There's, there's a, the, we've just got a few, few things to get through. Yeah. And then there's a, another sort of little project I'm working on at the minute, which is a little bit more, I talk a little bit more about it, so it'll be next year. It's a it's a short, um, short or limited series podcast, and it's a kind of sideways look at the fifty second for its its six months in in war. So it's a it, we there's a few sort of a few little stories that have come up, and, and I can uh, and what we can do is just have a look at each week something happens and just have a little sideways look. But uh, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the background, as you guys know, and it's the worst thing when people say, oh, I can't really talk about it. But there are some things that are that are, that are up and running and, and it's about getting to the point where you can start talking about them. But the, the research continues. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, just keep going into the, the archives. It's a bit addictive. Once you get into it, you know, you can just keep going and picking at it and picking at it and picking at it. And just when you think you've found everything you need to know about, more stuff cops up. Yep. But I think what did Fifty Second Lowland do? They were going to be sent to Japan. Well, there was some d- discussion, and yeah. White himself uh, he he ends his war in Florida, doesn't he? And he's on his way to. Well, doesn't get well, to Florida. They, that's it. He, he, no, he doesn't quite get to Florida. The plan is, and I don't know. I've, I need to look at this. I mean, Fifty Second is still going now. Yeah. So you get the Fifty Second Lowland Regiment. In fact, I was in Iraq with people from the 52nd Lowland Regiment. That penny only dropped a couple of years ago. I went, oh, bloody hell. <laughs> and there were, there were guys from the KOSB. But actually, yeah, so 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 if you think about it, they've been in the, the war less than anybody else. So the idea is that when the, the big push for Japan, they they will form that. And and White gets told he's off to, to Florida. Whether that was ever a plan, I don't know. It doesn't make sense. It makes more sense if they go. What he actually does is where he ends up in, in, in Palestine and, and Egypt as part of the the strategic reserve uh, in in the first battalion, they actually stay. I'm a fifty second stay in Germany until forty six. They 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 form part of British Army of the Rhine. Of course, more the more senior divisions that that have been out since Normandy, they get sent home quicker. But they actually stay in they stay in Germany until sort of early forty six, and before they they get transferred back, and and before long they get disbanded into into a brigade. Um, but a lot of the officers. From the fourth battalion, stay in the, in the fourth battalion. So, um, you he does mention him a guy called uh, Donald Hogg, who's the commander of C Company. He actually ends up a uh, lieutenant colonel, and he commands the fourth, and he's in charge of um, the, the the association and things like that. Because it's um it's very similar to the to the Sherwood Rangers before the war. It's the same type of people. It's the same sort of backgrounds. Lots of hunting, and it's a social club. So a lot of the guys stay with it after the war. Um, the guys that are still alive, that is. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a great story, it really yeah, is, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, it's been fantastic to have that real detailed perspective that you you can bring to it, Andy. It really has. Well, I could talk about it for hours, but <laughs> as my kids have found out, <laughs> but I've been trying to I've been trying to indoctrinate my son, so I take my son to college every morning in the car, and I've just been putting with the jocks on in the background. Yeah, that's good. Just to. See, if, I, I, I don't know if it's hit yet, but eventually... Yeah, it just, it's a trip, trip. He'll get there. He'll get there. He'll get him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, brilliant. Well, <laughs> Andy, thanks so much for coming and talking to us. Um, let, yeah, do let us know when that podcast's up, because we will, of course, um, 
Oh, thank you. Nudge it along. And I want to thank you for turning me onto the book because, you know, when I when I came to write Command, I thought I've got to have someone who isn't essentially at a desk. You know, the, the stuff going over general's desks is one thing. Um, it's the actual people who've got to do it at the other end of the food chain that um, you would need to be talked about. In a way, one of the things that's interesting about White's experience of the war is, you know, when we talk about allied material preponderance, yeah, fine. But there are days where there aren't tanks available. So they're just going to yeah. have to do it PBI style on foot, right? Because yeah. because there aren't tanks, there aren't enough. And this idea yeah. that, you know, all the allies have to do is show up with, you know, 40,000 Sherman tanks and that's the that's the, the fate has been accompli as a result is, isn't true. Someone's still got to go over that start line. And he goes over start lines for the for the whole of the last portion of the war. You know, every other day, basically. Well, I, I know we're coming to an end, but I've, I've picked out a quote from the the early diary, and it kind of answers a lot of that stuff. I don't know if we've still got time. Of course, we have. Thing. So this is actually on the first page of the unpublished chapter within with the jocks, which I was managed to see. Now I'm not brilliant at reading stuff out, so there might be a few bumps along the way, but it gives you an idea of of, of White's approach to that, and it specifically talks about material in that sense. So. The idea of killing fellow human beings, let alone animals, is in so personal a way as the infantry fighting seemed beyond contemplation. Even the prospect of doing it in the longer, more impersonal range offered by the artillery struck me as no better than stabbing with one's eyes shut, an evasion of moral responsibility. Nevertheless, I could see the need to fight the war clearly enough and realised that somebody had to do the actual fighting and could see no logical reason why it should not be me. Before and after joining up, I'd often prayed that this situation would not arise. Now it had, and there was no getting out of it. I prayed that somehow in the going forward to make as good a job I could of the situation, an intelligence greater than mine, yet heed my desires and lead my steps on a green track through the fire, while doing the minimum slaughter duty would permit. Quite as strong as the desire not to kill, on the other thoughts of which I felt most shameful in not being able to decide whether perhaps they might not be even more powerful, is the awful reverse side of the coin, where three seeming possibilities, each progressively worse to contemplate, namely being either killed or maimed oneself, or by far the worst of all prospect, being in any way responsible for the loss of men entrusted to me. He basically goes on to say the reason why he picks infantry fighting is because he believes that using excessive material force might be sinful. Wow. Wow. So he's basically saying he would rather be up close and personal. At least there's an equality in, in what we're doing. Wow. So That's it's kind amazing. of a weird look. Yeah, you wouldn't have thought of Nazi's religion. That sounds incredibly powerful to me. I have no idea. I have no idea. So I apologise for messing well, up. But I'll, he, I'll, he only I'll... talks about, I mean, there's only a couple of times where he actually says our cause was just in the book. There's a point yeah. where he does actually say that. At least our cause. He says at least our cause was just. He says, you know, we're going to have to kill people. And it's terrible. And the whole, that the world's gone mad and the situation should come about that we're having to do this. But at least our cause is just, is what he says. Yeah. It, it, so so the, the last, the last paragraph is that the only mitigating aspect of the transfer was to my mind that infantry fighting would be less one-sided and perhaps because of that more morally defensible than stocking game or even rabbits with modern lethal weapons. At least there would be an equality of footing with our quarry. So that's a very weird way of looking. I mean, that's so that's his Christian Science talking. That's him trying to justify the sin by saying at least, at least there's a ch more of a chance that they could kill me, and therefore, it, you know, am I really sinning or am I really so bad? My <laughs> God, yeah. And that that was written that was written after the war. So it's just yeah, but maybe that isn't his attitude at the time. That's him trying to get to grips with it later. That at least I did yeah. that. I mean that. Mm. that that's so much food for thought in itself, isn't it? Yeah, that, isn't it? God, isn't it? I've never heard that expressed like that before because the, you know, every other person goes, well, at least we have loads of artillery. At least we have loads of tanks. At least we can bomb. Yeah, them. everyone else who's got a conscience about it goes and drives an ambulance. Yeah. Yeah, but he feels there's a duty, and that likes what I was saying about the duty side of things. You know, he feels that why should anybody else do it? He's got a responsibility. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Man. Well... Well, Andy, and thanks for coming one. on. That's just been fascinating. Thank you. Yes, yeah. At the front, however, the individual was lost as the Jerry's or them, a killable or be killed entity at the apex of concentrated training skill and immense expenditure. At least we had a right cause. Wow. That's yeah. as close as he gets in the book to, to that. Yeah. 
Well, thanks, Andy. I'm going to have to spend the weekend thinking about that bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll send it over to you. Thanks. I'll send it I mean, over to you. Bit, it, because it is this... Here's an analogy I want to throw at you guys that's been b- bugging me all week. Ages and ages ago, I used to... A friend of mine used to work with Darren Brown, you know, the master of mind control. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're in the room. And Darren, Darren did this trick once where he played tw- chess against 12 people, right? He had them in a circle and he played them all... He played them all, played chess against them all, right? And so what he did was he played bloke one against bloke six. So he'd remember the moves of the other guy, the other side. He didn't play chess against, he used them all to play each other, right? By remembering right. the moves they'd done, copying <laughs> them, right? So they were all essentially playing each other and he wasn't having to play chess at all. And I, a moment I saw that, I thought, hey, that's obvious what's going on. And I, and I ran into him with this thing and I went, well, come on, it's obvious what you did, right? You just, you just, copied the games and he was so insulted because because he still had to bloody do it right the, the, the actual doing of it was incredibly difficult and very often when people and this is this is where i'm going with this people go oh well the allies just had more stuff they still had to do it they still had yeah. to yeah you still yeah, had to yeah. you know so darren still had to remember every one of those chess moves off 12 players in a you know like, like the colossal yeah, yeah, effort yeah. required. Just seeing what those the- infantry battalions have still got to step out of their foxholes yeah. and go across yeah. the open ground. That's yeah. exactly the point I'm making. That it's all very well going. Oh, well, it's obvious how it was done. It's plain. It's plain it was done because of material preponderance or greater industrial power. Yeah, but someone's still got to go over those start lines. Someone's still got even the blokes. Mm. Even the you know material preponderance is no guarantee that a, a B17 won't be shot down or a, a tank yeah. a tank won't be brewed up. You know, you may have lots of Shermans, but that, in a way, offers tons more targets to the enemy, in, you know, as much as anything else. And I just think sometimes cracking the code of how it was done doesn't get you any closer to understanding how it was done. Yeah. You, you know I mean, what I mean? You know, technically, technically speaking, having the logistical chain is a... Yes, of course we're going to win. I say we, the royal yeah. we. But, but yeah... It, you know, still got to do it. You have to yeah, and if you're on. and if you're as we've said many many times before, if you're infantry in Northwest Europe, your chances of getting through unscathed are worse than they were in 1914 to 1918. There's even an argument to say at Ibn Buren, which is of course the the big disaster that happens where they get shot up by their own people, and he loses. That's the biggest loss of life for White. He loses eight men killed in, in the space of ten minutes, and about four or five wounded. That happened because they have a spare anti-tank regiment knocking around, right? It's you know they've got this, they've got their own archers, their SP guns, seventeen pounders. Um, they haven't got any armor with them, so we'll say, well, we've we've got some of these. They can be attached to you. And you think, well, if they didn't have that excessive stuff, would that have happened? It's it, you know you start getting into that, and then you get into the you know the really dark circles of you know it's butterfly theory, yeah, yeah. isn't it? If the, if they went there, but you know. Well, so much food for thought. Thanks so much, Andy. And like yeah, I said, we'll, we'll give the podcast a nudge when it materialises. Um, I'm always saying this. Go and read With the Jocks by Peter White. Why don't you? Do yourselves a favour. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, we'll see you all soon. Thanks very much for listening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheerio. Bye.